Before I begin, I'd like to thank the Teaching and Learning Resource Committee for inviting me to speak, and especially Ryoko Yamamoto, the TLRC Chair, for her assistance in preparing this talk. All of its mistakes and confusions are mine, of course. Um, these days, attrition among college students is generally acknowledged to be a problem. This use of the passive voice conceals the actors responsible for constructing attrition as a problem. So let me rephrase. People with varying interests in higher education, ranging from college presidents and top administrators to the publishers of college guides, the Secretary of Education, and the President of the United States, have proclaimed that student attrition from college is a problem, and more than that, they've promoted the idea that attrition rates are an important consideration for graduating high school seniors when making decisions about where to apply to college and where to attend. It has also become a metric by which public, public colleges effectiveness as educational institutions is being measured, a metric to determine funding streams. They don't talk about it as attrition, though. Uh, they use uh, not quite complementary measures of the students who don't leave, student retention or graduation rates. In this framing, there are clear distinctions among different types of institutions by attrition rates. Um, there's a fair, uh, so let's, here's a, Here's some information about five different schools. Um, this is the average attrition at five different types of schools, um, averaging five, uh, five different years from 2008 to 2012. And their average six-year graduation rate, this is a three-year average from 2010 to 2012. And the source of this is the iPads data at the Department of Education. There's a fairly clear conclusion to be drawn here, one that sets up a particular kind of hierarchy among schools. School E, on the far right, does better than school C in terms of attrition, and uh, which in turn does better than school A. The relationship between attrition and graduation rates is also clear, if not entirely linear. So you can see that school E has a very low attrition rate and a very high graduation rate. That gets a little bit more muddled as you go towards the left. Um, this has to do with the breakdown of student entrance freshman versus transfer ratios. Um, these attrition and graduation rates become less surprising when we see the school's names, which are small, but there they are. You've got school E is Yale, school A is York College, and you can see the ones in between. When these powerful people talk about college student attrition, it's often conceptualized in terms of institutional success or failure, a summary measure of how well the college is doing its job, how well it's, it functions as an institution. This is almost certainly a misuse of the concept of attrition, which exists in the higher education research, research literature as a way to measure aspects of student progress toward the goal of completing a degree. That is, research on student attrition typically focuses on students and the ways in which institutions and students interact with their respective qualities and strengths, and what the outcomes of those different kinds and levels of interaction are for the broader mission of higher education, which is the success of the students who enroll. And I say success in quotation marks. Using attrition rates as a measure of institutional effectiveness substitutes a single measure as if, we're, it were, as if it were a clear indicator of a college's ability to achieve highly complex mission goals having to do with learning, socialization, knowledge, skills, habits, awareness, ways of thinking, and civic en engagement. Different perspectives on student attrition may seem similar, um, but there are important differences. From the student level, Attrition may inter interrupt a person's education, and whether that's a result of institutional failures, personal problems, or the broader economic situations in society, the focus is on ensuring that those factors don't interrupt or derail the trajectory of people who, without the knowledge, skills, and credentials of a college degree, might have uh, significantly reduced life chances. From the institutional level assessment uh, perspective, uh, attrition rates have become an indirect measure of a kind of, a kind of report card for colleges of institutional effectiveness, a high-stakes test that institutions dare not fail because um, failure to prevent student attrition increasingly threatens to bring with it reduced resources and therefore weaker institutions ultimately less able to perform their missions. So these are backwards on the slide. But um, from the institutional perspective of evaluation, there's an expectation of efficiency with incentives and punishments associated with that. And from the institutional mission, 
there's an attempt to understand what works and what doesn't. So to be clear, when I use the term attrition, I mean the rate at which college students depart their home institution. The presumption is usually that these students drop out and don't complete the degree they have been pursuing. But attrition also encompasses other reasons for leaving a college or university, to transfer to another school, to stop out, to take time off from school returning at a later date, or to accept a full-time job, one that makes continuing in school either too difficult or superfluous for that occupation. Some schools even include the students who graduate as part of their in-house attrition rate, which makes no sense at all. I will return to the pol political concerns with attrition among college students, but first I want to talk a little bit about how researchers who've studied attrition have come to understand its causes and its complementary phenomena, its inverse student retention and graduation rates. There are three main schools of thought, um, three main perspectives on the most important dimensions of attrition and retention among college students. The factors that are most important for influencing how likely a student is to stay at the college or university that she's or he's attended. Um, the student demographics and academic preparation uh, perspective looks at the ways in which incoming students, uh, at the ways in which what in incoming students bring with them can be causally connected to their persistence and attrition behavior. This includes a wide range of considerations that institutions use to select their incoming classes. Some have to do with academic preparation, how well did students do in high school, what were their SAT or ACD, ACT scores. Others have to do with less intentional selection factors, like, so, like socioeconomic status, in which access to financial aids and scholarships, together with attendance cost, tuition and fees, room and board, travel, essentially serve as admissions filters, as in, I got in, but I can't afford that school. Generally, academically better prepared students persist at higher rates in college. The same is true for students from higher social classes, from majority race ethnicity groups. Um, having more than one demographic advantage isn't necessarily additive, but there is a combined effect of being high SES, having had a successful high school career experience, and being from an overrepresented race ethnicity group in college. This set of factors is actually in the hands of admissions committees, the financial backers of the colleges, funded endowments, development offices that raise money for scholarships and for financial aid, and indirectly the students and their parents who respond to a complex set of information produced by marketing campaigns, that vague thing called reputation, college guidebooks, which often use the very metrics I'm discussing here to categorize colleges and their value to the student. Um, I don't have a slide of this, but if you look at the U.S. Department of Education website, they rate every single college in the United States. And the first thing that you see is the graduation rate and the post-college average salary and the tuition for that school. There's actually a wealth of information on the Department of Education site that gives you a lot of information about each college. But the first look information is a striking graphic that highlights, highlights tuition, graduation rates, and average salary. The, another factor is the recruitment strategies used by uh, enrollment offices to keep, seek the kind of students that they want to attract. Schools, schools with lower attrition rates typically use lower attrition rates, that's higher graduation rates, typically use more targeted admissions pro uh, policies, which can mean anything from skimming only the highest achieving students and looking for legacy admits to carefully constructing a diverse class of students to bring the widest range of backgrounds, talents, and perspectives to the campus community, often achieved with financial and prestige incentives or merit scholarships. The second, that didn't do anything. The second, uh, perspective is the student experience qua social integration. Uh, and this isn't simply about students experiencing and enjoying college or the college experience. It's about the ways in which students become integrated in college once they arrive on campus and are in classes, but in a Durkheimian sense. Their level of social integration is positively correlated with their persis persistence. Less well integrated students are more likely to attrit from college or from that college than students who are highly integrated, all other things being equal. This integration can take many forms, having a set of friends on campus, being involved in a club, either social or academic, 
being involved in a team, a Greek organization, having professors with whom they regularly interact, week in, week out, year after year. It's important to remember that these interactions need not necessarily be fun. They can be trying, difficult, challenging, even contentious. Think, for example, about students who get involved in social movements while they're in college. But the reliable existence of people on campus who know students, whom students know, is crucial to students' ability to persist, to be connected to the social dimension of the campus community, and to contend with the kinds of setbacks that happen to all students, bad grades, relationships gone wrong, health crises, and so forth. This is actually the dominant perspective in higher education today, and it has resulted in heavy investment in student affairs infrastructure, student government, clubs and activities, outreach to commuters, school spirit, emphasis on student-faculty interactions, attempt to enhance cohort effects, things like first-year experience programs, and mistakenly customer, I mean student, satisfaction. That is, we look, this has been interpreted by a lot of schools as students need to be happy when they're integrated, but they don't need to be happy, they just need to be integrated. The third perspective, they are often happy in retrospect, even though they weren't happy at the time. <laughs> Um, the third is the institutional fit and atmosphere. This is a sometimes reflexive basket of concepts, factors, and factors also related to the student experience, and, uh, but it includes mostly indirect efforts and measures. For example, the fit between students and institutions is seen in this perspective both in terms of student engagement, as in the student experience qua social integration, and in terms of academic success, but also as a result of group affiliation among students. Are there students like me on campus and the demographic mix generally? It emphasizes the responsibility of institutions themselves for outcomes related to creating a conducive environment for students, and this combines the mix of students, the result of the admissions process, with the institution's infrastructure, initiatives, offerings, and expectations. Students who are different, whether in their own demographic qualities or some mismatch, mismatch with the institution, are not well received, uh, are not as well received, fail to become integrated, and there's an intentional passive voice there, they fail to become integrated. It's not the student's failure in this perspective. Addressing these kinds of factors involves careful institutional strategic planning that matches institutional resources to admissions policies and student needs, acknowledges the institution's responsibility for creating a climate conducive to the kinds of students attending socially, intellectually, and in terms of the institution's mission. Um, each of these perspectives has significant empirical evidence to back it up, and I think, as I think is evident, they have consider considerable overlap. They've been developed over time and with an awareness that students are a varied bunch, that institutions have different strengths and weaknesses and different types of strengths and weaknesses, and that all legitimate colleges and universities have clear missions to teach and to socialize students so that they have a better chance in life, so that they can make meaningful contributions to society, and so that they can find their places in a complex modern world where a college-level perspective is crucial to navigating the complexities aside from any special skills or knowledge or training. That said, how important is attrition? Is it a problem? As a two-time attritter myself, I can only say the way that attrition is increasingly being used in the policy realm doesn't make a lot of sense for the liberal arts college curriculum and mission. At Boston University, as a freshman, I'm a deficit. I'm, maybe I'm a deficit everywhere. But because I attrited from the school, after only one year, and that's the most crucial year, because when you lose students after one year, you never get them back. Um, after one year, I left and I ruined their statistics for that year or I contributed to whatever bad statistics they had at that year. Um, they can't use anything on me anymore once I've left. After that, I stopped out for a semester damaging Stony Brook stats, and yet here I am, a tenured professor with a PhD in hand. So my attrition behavior was, at least for me, anecdotal that it is, as it is, uh, selecting on the dependent variable because who else would be giving this talk? Um, but for me, it worked out fine. The fact that it looks bad for those institutions was not necessarily bad for me. As I mentioned at the start of this talk, the concept of attrition is sometimes being measured in illogical ways, uh, including graduates, for example, which happens at some institutions we may know, and as a stand-in for institutional effectiveness. But those uses fail utterly to consider the mission of nonprofit higher education, whether public or private, to enhance the life chances of its students to further knowledge and learning, and to instill in the population a set of democratic, liberal, 
arts values and perspectives that are necessary to a strong civil society. Colleges are not factories to be judged by the efficiency of their output per dollar spent, even when budgets are tight for whatever reasons. Of course, institutional inefficiencies need to be addressed and failed policies reviewed and improved. The coarse measure of institutional attrition, a single percentage, is typically the consequence of myriad factors, but it can validly reflect, it cannot, sorry, it cannot validly reflect all of those factors. When examined at an increasingly granular level, a high attrition rate may not be an institutional failure at all, but an artifact of the population served, students who stop out or transfer, the national economy, poor perceived image or misaligned is institutional fit, admit the wrong students and they will leave. Admit the right student in terms of institutional fit and those students will be successful in the dimensions I just described, improved life chances, knowledge, awareness, and civic engagement. Defunding or otherwise penalizing an institution for internal policy missteps and mistakes is a mindlessly blunt method for addressing institutional problems relying on the incentive of lost revenue and missing the nature of bureaucratic response to that kind of metric. Under such practices, such misuses of the meaning of college attrition, schools can be expected to juke their stats, redirecting energies to meet a metric rather than institutional measure. Knowing how attrition works makes it less of a problem and more of a source of important information. And, oh, these are now going to change color. And there's a selected bibliography for you. And for those of you who will appreciate this, thank you very much. <laughs> I'm, I'm all done. Thank you very much, Jacob.